Hi, I'm Nancy Blotner. At Caldwell University, we believe that all citizens should be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation, making a difference. MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Johnson & Johnson, The Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, New Jersey Resources, Delta Dental of New Jersey, everyone deserves a healthy smile, Caldwell University, and by PNC, Grow Up Great, promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey, and by New Jersey Family Magazine and NJFamily.com. This is Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato. Today we are examining the question of health equities, inequities, if you will. What exactly? are inequities in health, and why does it matter to all of you watching? Because it is a huge societal issue. Brought together four experts on the topic. Let me introduce them to you. She's been with us before, she's back again. Dr. Pamela Clark, President and Chief Executive Officer of the North Community Health Centers. Dr. Bob Atkins, Director of New Jersey Health Initiatives at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Dr. Adam Jarrett, who is Executive Vice President, Chief Medical Officer, holy name, Medical Center. And finally, Elizabeth Williams Perry, excuse me, Elizabeth Williams Riley, my bad, is president and CEO of American Conference on Diversity. I apologize, Ms. Riley, and in that spirit, I'm opening up with you. Ah. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, you go to a cocktail party. I'm not saying you drink, not my business, but here's a question. Someone says, what do you mean? What's a health and equity? Well, first of all, I think people need to understand equity. Uh, equity and quality are not the same things. Go ahead. And equity means that you are helping to meet people where they are. You give them what's necessary mm. for them to gain access, to feel better, to live a quality life. So when you understand the difference between the two, it's, it, it's not a question of what you're trying to accomplish when you talk about equity. Got it. It's really meeting people where they are, giving them sufficient resources in order to move forward to live a better life. Okay, Bob, I said that this is an issue for everyone. Say someone, devil's advocate, someone's listen. I got mine. Yeah. I'm good. Got right. good health care. Got good coverage. Getting taken care of. What's this whole thing about health equity? Why is it my business that there's equity in health services for others, not me? Go ahead. Right. I think we really want to live in a free and just society where there's opportunity mm -hmm. for all. And equity really is about this opportunity. And as Elizabeth pointed out, kind of closing that gap between the least among us and those with the most resources. And how do you, kind of, how do you give everyone that opportunity for healthy, longer lives and closing that gap. And that's something that, that's what makes this a great society is that we, we do think about the opportunity, this opportunity to pursue health, happiness, um, and all those kinds of things that we all want. So Dr. Jarrett, let me ask you this. Children in particular, I wanna focus on those who are most vulnerable to the health inequities that exist every day. Talk children, and Dr. Clark, I'll bring you in as well, go ahead. So I think we have to understand that uh, how healthy you are is not just based on your genetics. It's based on the environment that you grew up in, the environment that you live in. And so if you're living in an environment where you don't have access to good, good food, if you don't have access to good schools, it affects your health. Uh, and that's not even getting to the point where if you don't have access to medical care. So it affects our children. Um, and, and yes, we want to live in a society where we want equity, but it also makes sense mm -hmm. economically and socially to for, us all to, for us all to be healthier. Okay, but it's interesting. You seem to be referring to, and Dr. Clark and I have been mm -hmm. in a lot of meetings where the phrase social determinants of health, and I believe, Doctor, mm -hmm. that's what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. Could you break this down a little bit more for us, Doctor? Social determinants of health, say, tell me if I'm wrong. Race? Yes. Income? Yes. Housing? Yes. Transportation? Yes. Violence in the community? Yes. Violence in the home? Yes. What am I missing? Ah, you have all of the elements, and did you mention food? Go ahead. Did you mention the fact that somebody lives in a house and their mom and the dad, they don't know their child is coming home tonight because they went out to play? Um, those are healthcare disparities. But here's another point, is the fact that even though we have 
these healthcare entities right next door to them, because that's what uh, federally qualified health centers are. You are, in fact, a federally qualified, qualified healthcare health center. center. Go ahead. And we are actually in the community where you can come to see a board-certified physician to take care of your health. So someone says, wait a minute, where's the inequity you're taking care of? You say? No, because they still won't come through the door. So we serve 49,000 patients in New York, East Orange, Orange and Irvington. And let me tell you something. We also, based upon the state and the federal government, extend the hours of operation from 9 o'clock to 7 p.m., Monday through Friday. Access. Saturday from 9 to 5 and Sunday 9 to 1. Yet, mm -hmm. between 4.30 and 7 p.m., the health center is empty. Why? Because people still don't believe that it is open for them to come in. Wow. There are people living right next door to the health center who we have to beg them to come to the health center. Okay, so this is what's fascinating to me. And again, we've all, you're the only one, um, we've had these conversations, but not on this particular topic. And we're thrilled to have you with us. But I am curious about this, and I want you to respond to it. So, Elizabeth, someone says, you know, don't we have Medicaid? I mean, we have Medicaid. Isn't, someone says, isn't that what that's for? Isn't it what it's for? For mm -hmm. those people who don't have uh, the um, health equity mm -hmm. that we all say we want, mm -hmm. Medicaid, you say? Well, you never know how much your past will affect your future until it shows up in your present, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when systems and different policies are put in place to serve a certain population and not, and had not taken into consideration all populations, mm -hmm. you deal with the aftermath of that. So when we talk about policies and how they're dictated and who names, who gets services and, and creates the policies, if they didn't have those individuals, those folks in mind when they created the policy, they continue to be marginalized out of the mm -hmm. system. And so when you talk about programs like Medicare, Medicare, who had access to that? Who actually is, is going to be qualified, has the person to tell them how to fill out the paperwork, let them know what's available to them. If they don't have that level of education and understanding is, well, that that's accessible to you just because of, they don't get involved. And if you've ever been burned by the system or you have been treated un unfairly in a system, you tend not to go to that place. Even if it's intended for you, because the intent was good, but the impact was horrible. Mm -hmm. So, by the way, if you listen to us on the audio side, this is, in fact, Think Tank, a conversation that we try to have with folks from all over the region about issues that are national, issues that have national implications, but we happen to bring experts together from our region to do that. But let me ask you, doctor. Someone says, okay, I, I like to help close this, these inequities. I'd like to close the, quote, gap between... The haves, it's not just the haves and the have-nots, it's, it's more than that. Those who are getting the health care they need and those who are not. Are there tangible ways to, quote, unquote, help close that gap? There are, but uh, it's not inexpensive. So mm -hmm. Medicaid is great, but Medicare doesn't really cover the cost of care. So you can't say, what do you well, mean? give me an example of that. that. That if you look at what providers are paid, when they're seeing a Medicaid patient, it is, it is pennies compared to what they need to, to, in some cases, run a small business, which many doctors are. What about but, doctors who don't accept it? And then because those fees are so low, the vast majority of doctors in Bergen County, where I am, don't accept it. So, although, you're talking about the government reimbursement, correct, I think, is what you're talking that, about. Correct. So, so although there are Medicaid doctors um, and, and we're doing a better job getting some insurance to patients, it is often difficult to find a specialist who takes Medicaid. It is difficult mm -hmm. to find a neurosurgeon or a gastroenterologist. We're doing a better job, I think, getting primary care doctors to take Medicaid, and that's great. But there are still huge gaps in care in patients, for patients who have Medicaid, and let alone we still are seeing a lot of uninsured people. And unfortunately, the last report I saw, this is the first year mm -hmm. uh, since the Affordable Care Act where the uninsured I, I, rate I'm, went up. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, by the way, I want to disclose that holy... Name yes. uh, supports some of our health care programming, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation does yes, certainly do. as well. But this is the thing I want to say, and I'm glad you mentioned the Affordable Care Act, because that's where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, Bob. For those who believe, or want to believe, that the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, that, hey, wait a minute, wasn't that supposed to, again, take care of the inequities that existed before and provide health care, health insurance, if you will, for those who historically had been denied that coverage, you say? 
And Steve, as you know, the Robert Johnson Foundation's big focus is really shifting that conversation from talking about what happens in the acute care setting, which is always going to be important, but how we take that conversation and move it upstream to where we work, play, live, and learn, and think about what happens in the communities. My first job out of nursing school, I was a school nurse at East Camden Middle School. And I encounter kids who miss school. In East Camden. East Camden Middle School. Describe yeah. that. Fifth, those. sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, it is one of the most child-dense communities in the state of New Jersey. Um, we're more than 35% of the population is, is under the age of 18. So it's very child dense. Um, but there are issues you know, that go way beyond thinking about the healthcare system that influence why kids didn't come to school and how they were ready to school, uh, uh, readiness for school, whether it be things like um, not having visual care, not having food in their stomachs, um, head lice. I had a kid miss school for two weeks with head lice, with head lice. And this, this child had health insurance, but they missed school for two weeks. So this influences What's going to happen downstream, right? So what happens? Um, we know it's much easier to prevent things than reverse it. It's much easier to prevent obesity than reverse it. And I think that's one of the geniuses of the foundation's focus is thinking about how do we take this Your conversation? Foundation. Yeah, the Robert Johnson Foundation. Thinking about, hey, let's think about the social determinants of health. Let's think about how we engage more different voices and sectors in this conversation. So we're not just having a conversation that I'm a nurse. We can't just talk to nurses and healthcare systems mm -hmm. and physicians. We have to involve transportation, housing, faith-based groups, the mm -hmm. youth. I heard you talk about youth. I mean, youth are really important. So how do we get them in the conversation? Because it's going to take everyone pulling that direction. You know what's so interesting as we talk about this on Think Tank? And it, it always strikes me when we created this idea of doing Think Tank. It, it struck me that, and it continues to strike me, as you just said this, um, Bob Acton's just said this. We're calling this a program on health care. We're calling this a program dealing with health equity, the health equity gap health inequities. You just said transportation. You said nutrition. You yeah. said school-based. What, what else are we talking about? Oh, high talking school education. That's, that's, okay. that's, yeah. So realize you can say it's a program about health care, but is it not a fact, doctor, that this is, you can't talk about health care without talking about all these other issues, which, dare I say, there's a question here, trust me, gets very complicated. It's very complicated and it's very exciting that you said that because here's the point. We're talking about all these healthcare disparities that affect people. Disparities. Are we asking the people when we make the policies, is what he's saying. People are making the policies without asking the people mm. to participate. What would we ask them? So, but here's my point. I'm gonna, <laughs> here's my point. No, the Affordable Care Act starts November 1 to December 15. And every That's year... That's a sign-up period. Let's yes, clarify. Sign, We're actually yes. taping literally a week before November 1st. This will be seen after. Remind folks, put the website up. It is still the same website, healthcare.gov. That's the period to sign up. Why are you even raising that right now? I'm raising that point because now we have to prepare to help people to help themselves. So at the FQHC right now, the federally we, qualified we are healthcare federally fund. qualified health center, we are trying to certify 50 certified application counselors. These are people that have to be trained and pass the test to help people to navigate through the marketplace. That's not cheap. No, it's not. But we do get some funding from the state and some from the federal government to help us to actually do this. Now, here is the point. Go ahead. So we have everybody ready. So we're going to get 50. Last year, we did... 50 um, navigators. 50 we're navigators. Up against a break. Go ahead. 50 navigators that are in the health center. We're going to have health fairs outside in the community so that we can help Go them. Go ahead. Here is the point. When the person comes in, first and foremost, they have to see our ads and we have to see the flyers telling them to come, to come, to come. And even though you have all these ads out there, people still don't see it. Wow. Now, when they come in, when they come in, when they do come in and they walk through the marketplace, you're going to find that they don't qualify because, of <laughs> course, their income does not match the amount of premiums that they have to pay. What's the bottom line on all this? So the bottom line is that they push over to Medicaid where they can register for New Jersey Family Care. The point is that they never knew they could do it. A lot of time people come in, they're born here in this country. Don't even know they what they're eligible They don't know for. that they're eligible for Medicaid. Uh, Dr. Jared, I want to bring you back in to this. We're going to go to a quick break on Think Tank. I promise you, even though you may be telling yourself, oh, you believe, I'm good, my family's good, this issue of the health equity gap, it's all of our responsibility. That's right. It's not a cliche. It's true. That's why we're talking about it on Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato. will be right back. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. 
I'm Steve Adubato. This is Think Tank. More importantly, we're talking about the health equity gap. Dr. Jared, I promised you that I'd come back to you. Here's a question. I'm really making the case as you listen to your colleague, Dr. Clark. She's talking about how hard it is to get people to, dare I use the word, navigate the system. A, is that an accurate description? And B, is there a government policy that could in any way, if not fix it, improve it? So it's very accurate. I can tell you that at Holy Name, we, we are focusing on uh, what we call culturally competent care. So Describe we, that. So that is, that is making sure that we are providing care that meets the needs of the individual based on their culture, their race, their gender. Good example, is there an Asian? Oh, we, have a, we have an Asian health care program. So the example I was going to give you, in our Asian health care program, we have found that the Asian community in Bergen County is, are not big fans of health insurance. Don't understand why the Asian community doesn't understand the need or the value, especially the older Asian community, of health insurance because they're often immigrants who did not have to experience that if, if, for, from uh, their their home. So how do you how do you help so, close the gap so we with went, that community? We went out and we did very similar to what the FQHC did. We went out and we brought navigators to the table and helped people sign up for the Affordable Care Act. And we were very successful in, in doing that for that Asian community. Not easy. Not easy. None of this is easy. <laughs> Labor intensive. You don't get paid for it. So you're doing it because you want to help people get insurance. You, you, don't, get, like, you don't get the reimbursement. What, well, what are you well, saying? If you get people insured and they access care, then you certainly are, are better off as, an, as a health care organization. The organization. The organization is to help the community that you serve and to make sure that the providers who are caring for that community are reimbursed from insurance. Switch gears for a second. Um, Stereotypes around race and gender. We talk, you talked, uh, Dr. Jarrett, about um, culturally competent care. Well, I want to try to mix this up a little bit. So say someone is not particularly culturally competent. He or she, as a clinician in a healthcare setting, doesn't appreciate, understand issues of race, gender, transgender folks, et cetera, et cetera. Does that matter in terms of this gap? Well, you know, I often get that question about cultural competency, and I always challenge the notion of that term. Really? <laughs> yes, because how do you become competent in dealing with humanity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You live it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have lived experiences. You have learned experiences. And when you talk about humanity, is how well do you treat individuals? Individuals are dimensional. You can't even just take a person of, of one gender or one race and think of them as just one of those identities. No, but they excuse me for interrupting. Identities. I'm sorry for interrupting, Elizabeth, but there are folks. When and Dr. Jarrett was talking about people in the Asian community, particularly those who are older, it's not stereotyping, but there are cultural differences. Mm -hmm. Listen, I grew up in an Italian-American neighborhood about three miles from here. They went to one hospital, only saw certain doctors whose last name ended in a vowel, mm -hmm. and trust me, there were health care inequities for a lot of reasons that were cultural. But yeah, go ahead. But there are also people within that same community and in the Asian community who are first, second, third generations that have different experiences mm, and right. encounters with these systems. So their thinking is different from their great grandparents True. or their parents. So even there, you have diversity and lived experiences. Within, groups within that, are... that same group with the one identity. Mm -hmm. And so you cannot think that they, just because it's a homogeneous group, that they have the same lived and learned experiences. And you have to be sensitive and aware that they have different worldviews. It's not just that one thing. And they have different religions. True. They have different lifestyles, all, all different true. habits, but, everything. Dr. Jared, because I want to come back to, to, to Bob as well. But, but so, 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 so culture competent care starts with treating every individual with the best. With as the best, an individual. As an individual. But also understanding that if you run a hospital that takes care of a Jewish community, you better have a Sabbath elevator that's in the right. Sabbath room, right. right? If you take care of a, of a community that takes... How about takes, their Jehovah's Witness? And, and, and Jehovah's Witness patients, you have what to understand... With blood? You have to understand how a Jehovah Witness, knowing that there is diversity within the Jehovah right. Witness that's community, right. but that it's not the same as speaking to a non-Jehovah Witness about, <laughs> a, a, about getting blood. So yeah. culturally competent care, where I would agree with you but disagree a little bit, is you absolutely have to start with every person deserves to be treated as an individual. And you have to treat your caregivers to do that, but also you have to be aware of that, that how you treat someone, the, the amenities that you have, a Sabbath elevator, a Sabbath room, the right food for the Asian community is extremely important in terms of be creating a welcoming environment where patients are willing to get the care that they need. And it's a need. hybrid between individual, so hold on one second, so let me ask you something. I mentioned the issue of stereotyping. Mm. Is there, in your mind, from your experience, Bob, and the work of the foundation, is there any correlation between the stereotypes that some in the healthcare community providers have towards certain folks, gender, race, cultural, 
transgender issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Does it influence and impact adversely this health equity gap? Does it create the gap? Sure. Does I it contribute to the gap? Yeah, it definitely contributes. And I want to go back to Elizabeth's point because I think it's an important one when she talked about these policy systems change. And, and I think one of the policies and systems we have to change is making sure that we have as many different diverse voices around that table. Because if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And we, we, do, we know too many people that are not at the table. We know that youth aren't at the table, LGBTQ aren't at the table, different populations. If they're not there to speak for themselves, then we're going to miss those But Excuse pieces. me, Dr. Atkins, why would it be important that they be at the table when they're creating policy? Help us understand. Well, because that's, they have to be the ones to tell us, hey, we need that elevator. Hey, yeah. this is what's happening in this community. We, we, have, we have youth working in the city of Newark with Kalina Berryman uh, that we're funding that are going out. This is a not-for-profit? It's a not-for-profit, the right. Abbott Learning Center, which is working to engage youth as partners. And what they found um, really affects what's happening in education. They looked at school absenteeism and, and had the youth tell the voice of why they're not coming to school wow. because they're, they're, they're taking care of their younger siblings. Um, because there's transportation issues, because there's housing issues, and these things affect. We only find that out, though, if they're at the table. Let me ask you, is there a role for, uh, maybe, I don't want this to sound self-serving, but what can we in the media do? Okay, other than having a program like this, I got that part. But what else can we in the media do if we want to help? If not, we're not going to fix any gap. We're going to tighten up this gap, create greater equity in the healthcare system. And what can we in the media actually do in your mind, Doctor? I'm glad you asked that question, because <laughs> every time I come to this, this table, I always thank you for inviting me, because it gives me an opportunity to spread the word about what people need to do to help themselves. Because at the end of the day, we could talk about policies and we could talk about what we need to give to people, but we also need to talk about what people need to do for themselves to help themselves. Without government, without a nonprofit, but do for yourself. Yes. Accessing government, yes. accessing, nonprof accessing nonprofits. Go ahead. Tell people they're empowered to do certain things. Educate people what they need to do, what they need to ask for when they come to a health center looking for care. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about cultural competency right now, but does anybody think about the person who is actually supposed to do it mm -hmm. to the person who is coming through the door? Think about it. Because here we know everybody has their ideas and views about cultural changes and differences. Right. And so they come to work with it. Now you are promoting to the, the environment that we need to educate people about culture and competence, have classes, training, and that's all good. Because we do all of that. Now does it really convert the person to change their mindset when somebody comes in the door and they're faced with it? Then you also have to ask the question, how do we empower the, the, um, the, the consumers of healthcare so that they can also help the person who is providing and the service? And also be advocates for themselves. Yes. Can, can we do that, Dr. Jarrett? Can we, and, I, and when I say me, I mean as a society, can we help people as it relates to this health equity gap, which is longstanding and not easily addressed? Can we genuinely help people to be greater advocates for themselves? Yes, and we need to, but it is a challenge. Um, you know, people need to learn to eat right. They need to have access to the food that's healthier, but they need to eat right. Mm -hmm. They need to take the medication that is prescribed for them. They need to have access to that medication, but they also need to take it. And so, you know, as, as someone who, before I was a, a CMO, was in practice, I Chief can tell you, officer. Chief Medical Officer, mm -hmm. uh, I was in practice as a primary care doctor for 15 years, and I took care of a population that, that did not have a lot of inequity. It was a Bergen did County, not. did not. It was a Bergen County, very white population, they still were non-compliant. They still didn't take their medicine. They, they had access, and, they, and despite having access, they still did not take their medicine. They still did not eat right. They still did not exercise. Mm. So you're, you, you have a multiple layers of problems. Right. You have to create access, yeah. and then you have to make it so people understand you, the importance of being compliant. You know, real quick, in two minutes left, uh, Dr. Jared raised this issue that he's a physician, happens to be white, serving a pretty comfortable, financially white community. In terms of this health equity gap, how important is it that the people who are the clinicians look like the people who they're serving? I, I, I think you can overemphasize that. I think you I can't think over. Uh, I think do you think it's overrated? It yeah, I think it's really. I think I think it's important. But I mean, I think what's more important is trying to figure out how you how you kind of connect people across. Um, connect with people. I mean, it's really the humanity. Think about that, that connection. So, so we can, we can. I mean, and I'm, I'm faculty in the, in the school of nursing. We try to train. Um, nursing students to be culturally competent sure. and, and have those kinds of competencies, but it's more important to make that connection. 
Real final comments here, Elizabeth. I think that what we have to understand, too, is it, healthcare is self-care, and it's collaborative work. And if we are not all working together towards that common goal, it doesn't happen. The gaps don't close. They get wider. Mm. And we have to think about more than just the educational components of health care, the accommodations. And what Dr. Garrett said was that we have to make sure our facilities can accommodate the needs of these individuals. So it's not just the individual in terms of direct care, but everything that surrounds them. Dr. Jarrett, Elizabeth, and Dr. Clark, um, Dr. Atkins, I want to thank all of you. Thank this you. health equity gap is everyone's business, and I promise you we'll continue to not just cover it, but try to make sense of it and be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for this particular edition of Think Tank. So if you want to hear more Think Tank, there's something called Think Tank, the podcast. It's on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. You can hear conversations just like this, but here's the difference. There's exclusive commentary that's available only on Think Tank, the podcast. Watch us here. Listen to us online. But remember, most importantly, here's the deal. Make sure you think for yourself. I'm Steve Adubato. Catch you next time. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the Russell Berry Foundation, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, Johnson & Johnson, the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, New Jersey Resources, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Caldwell University, and by PNC, Grow Up Great. Promotional support provided by NJ.com and by New Jersey Family Magazine and NJFamily.com. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Choosing a new family doctor can be confusing. Check with your health insurer to see which physicians near you participate with your plan. Find out which hospitals the doctor uses and who covers when the doctor is away. And remember to schedule an appointment with your new doctor in advance to fill out any paperwork without the added stress of being sick.